Good morning and welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 12th of November and this quick look ahead at the beginning of the week beginning the 15th of November with me Michael Hewson. It's been another week of record highs for the likes of the Dow, the DAX, Stock 600, the CAC Courant has also joined the party while the FTSE 100 has moved um, to within touching distance of 7,400 in fact earlier today it actually achieved that milestone, marking another 20-month high, thus reaching my target for um, the end of this year. However, we sort of retreated a little bit back from that um, in the last hour or so. But none the, nonetheless, the line of least resistance for stock markets continues to be towards the upside, um, though there are some early signs of anxiety um, that the recent moves that we're seeing higher are starting to look a little bit stretched. And how often have I said that over the course of the past few weeks and months? But I think one of the things that we've taken away from this week, obviously, we've had a fairly decent payrolls report last Friday that was fairly positive. Um, fairly Goldilocks scenario there, um, sort of supported, I think, the Federal Reserve's caution in terms of the timeline to taper. We saw at the beginning of the week um, some fairly decent China trade numbers. And when I say fairly decent, I mean in terms of the export numbers, um, a rise of 28.1% in October, which suggests that um, the global economy despite the various supply chain constraints, um, is still there's still decent demand um, out there within the global economy as, as we head towards the Christmas period and obviously US Thanksgiving as well, exports to those particular regions, the US, the EU and the UK were fairly strong, even if imports were a little bit on the weak side. And as we look ahead to this week's data, this coming week's data, we've got Chinese retail sales and industrial production. So that should give us an additional insight into how the Chinese economy is doing currently as we head into the fourth quarter. We've also got um, US and UK retail sales uh, this week as well. And certainly I think as far as the UK economy is concerned, we'll be looking for a little bit of a rebound after some pretty poor numbers since those bumper numbers that we saw back in April, uh, back in April, May. Um, since then, we've only seen one positive month of expansion for retail sales. And even that um, was a fairly negligible 0.1, 0.2% all the way back in June. So we're certainly, I think, overdue um, a little bit of a rebound in um, UK retail sales, if only um, for the very reasons that UK consumers and consumers more broadly, I think, um, are likely to bring forward some of their Christmas spend to ensure that they gain delivery of their products um, before the Christmas period, simply because of the um, before mentioned supply chain constraints that I mentioned earlier. We've also got US retail sales, as I said, 16th of November. Um, they've certainly been a lot more resilient than they have here in the UK. So in terms of this week, certainly in terms of retail sales, we've got China, the US and the UK to keep an eye out on. Um, I think this week's key event or the week just gone has been that bumper reading in US CPI, a 31 year high, 6.2%. I mean, just think about that for a minute, 6.2%. It's a huge jump. Um, let's not forget the Fed's target rate for inflation, albeit on the PCE measure, is 2%. So even excluding food and energy, um, we're still in the mid fives for um, US core CPI. And P you know, PPI is even higher than that. So that would suggest that even without um, and a potential increase in food and energy prices as we head into the winter period. We're already at 6.2%, and there is a fear that the worst is yet to come. 
And I think, you know, one of the reasons why we've seen this big move behind the dollar, but also in yields, um, the, the dollar has surged this week on the basis that the Federal Reserve is going to find it very, very difficult to ignore the fact that CPI is at its current levels. You know, you can talk about transitory all you like. Transitory, the phrase for transitory is almost meaningless now. It means different things to different people. But I can assure you, if you're a consumer going to the supermarket or going to fill up your car, it doesn't feel very transitory to you. And I think that's that's the main concern. Obviously, central banks can't do anything about supply chain constraints and anything else like that. But they need to get rates off zero. They need to get rates higher because the market's already pricing it in. So, you know, they need to at least move in line with market expectations. They don't have to play catch up by any stretch of the imagination. And um, it, I think it could well be a similar picture for us here in the United Kingdom. We've got CPI numbers out later this week, as well as some unemployment numbers as well. And I think one thing that we, we can gain a little bit of encouragement from is the fact the unemployment rate is so low and vacancy rates are still very, very high. So I think it's unlikely that we're going to see a big jump in unemployment, even with the ending of furlough in September. And, it's, and it rather beggars belief why the Bank of England held off raising interest rates at the November meeting. But, you know, I've pretty much said my fill on that. Um, you know, there are a bunch of, um, <clears throat> well, I so say you don't need to know what I think of a Bank of England MPC members. Um, they're a bunch of charlatans. Um, having said that, there's, there's a, there is a distinct possibility we could see them go in December, but I'm certainly not putting any money on it, um, simply because they're just so unreliable. Um, you know, if, if uh, Mark Carney was the unreliable boyfriend, um, Andrew Bailey's the cheating husband. Um, anyway, uh, digressing ever so slightly, one thing that the big jump in US CPI has brought about is a big jump in the value of the US dollar. And we've seen that no better illustrated, not only in the dollar index, which is which is pushed up to a 15 month high, but also in the CMC dollar index. And it's interesting that we could well see um, a further move higher through here over the course of the next few sessions. Certainly, if you look at the difference between the US two year yield and the German two year yield, um, you have to really wonder why euro dollar isn't an awful lot lower than it is now. Um, the US two-year yield basically trades 125 basis points above the German two-year yield, which is deeply negative to 72 basis points. This is the orange line for the German two-year yield, minus 0.72%. US two-year yield, plus 0.53. I mean, euro dollar should be at parity. Um, you know, it absolutely amazes me that it is where it is. Um, it's way too high. Nonetheless, based on that graph, um, based on this chart here, um, the trend is still very much intact for euro dollar. We've broken below 115, um, and now we're opening up 114.12, um, which coincides with these peaks through here. But ultimately, I do expect euro dollar to continue to track lower on the basis of this trend line here. So we could get rebounds in euro dollar. We always generally tend to do, and we tend to get a little bit of short squeezes. But it's highly unlikely that the ECB will be raising rates to any extent anytime soon. Now, they may talk about changing their asset purchase program, and that's that then the PEP program is due to end in March. But they've also got a bond buying program running alongside that the asset purchase program where they're buying 20 billion euros a month as well. So, um, you know, they've got two asset purchase programs running at the moment, as well as interest rates that are deeply negative. So that would suggest to me that we're likely to fall uh, quite a bit more in terms of euro dollar, but that should also push euro sterling lower. And that obviously hasn't happened this week. Um, we've seen the pound continue to trend lower. Uh, we've broken below this series of lows through here. Um, broken below 134. That really now brings us close to this level here. 
um, which is 13160 um, there or thereabouts. So I think it's quite likely now, in the absence of any move back towards 134, 135, that regrettably I'm going to have to throw in the towel on my bullish sterling scenario and argue that we're probably going to trend back towards 130 with a lid around about 135 in the short to, to medium term. When the facts change, when, when the price action doesn't support a particular narrative, then as a trader and as a, and an analyst, you have to change your view, no matter how particularly wedded you are to an idea. If the evidence in front of you on the graph doesn't support your theory anymore, you change your theory. When the facts change, you change your mind. And I think that's one of the key lessons that I've learned over the course of the past 30 years. Don't get tied to a particular trade. I was beginning to have doubts about the sterling trade. And you can see from my various chart forum posts that I've been having doubts about it over the course of the past few days. And ultimately, you have to change your view. Don't get wedded to it. It's not a pride thing. It's not a hubris thing. It's just changing. It's just changing your view according to the changes in the price action. Euro sterling. Again, here, um, we've seen a little bit of a rebound over the course of the past few days. This is important. We're still below the 200 day moving average. And while we're below the 200 day moving average, I'm still bearish euro sterling. So for me, as long as we stay below this 200 day moving average and 86, then ultimately, I think what will happen here is similar to what happened here. We'll trade lower back towards 85, back towards 84, simply on the basis that the Bank of England will either have to hike rates either in December or in February. If they run through to form, they'll bottle it and go in February. But I've still got an inkling that they might decide to go in December. And yeah, we'll get all the headlines about Scrooge McDuck, Bank of England and all of that sort of nonsense. But a 0.15% rise in interest rates is neither here nor there. It goes from 0.1 to 0.25. And that's just a media clickbait headline more than anything else. It won't, in the wider scheme of things, amount to too much. At some point, the Bank of England will have to bite the bullet and, and nudge rates a little bit higher. OK, so in terms of unemployment, not really expecting too much in the way of any significant changes this week. 4.5% um, was the number at the last meeting, or oh, sorry, not the last meeting, the last reading um, in August, expecting that to remain unchanged at around about 4 percent. There's already over a million vacancies in the UK economy. So even with um, even with the end of furlough and potential redundancies there, with a little bit of retraining, an awful lot of these people should, I say should, be able to um, get new roles. And one of the plus points, of course, over the course of the past few weeks is the resumption of transatlantic travel on the 8th of November, which should open up um, some some of the travel and leisure sector and reduce the number of people um, potentially made redundant there as well. Yes, it's not a full service quite yet, but the fact that transatlantic travel has restarted um, would suggest that, that we're going to get a partial respite for the travel and leisure sector, even if the share prices of IAG and what have you don't really support that at the moment. UK CPI, um, this is going to be, I think, the key number for this week. For me, um, if the US CPI number is in any way a leading indicator, and generally they do tend to move in line with each other, even if they don't match each other, I mean, UK CPI is much, much lower. Um, but it did jump from 2% in July to 3.2% in August. Um, and there had been a concern that we might see a surge to 4% in fairly short order. Now, in September, we slipped back. Um, to 3.1 percent for the headline number and the core number slipped back from 3.1 percent to 2.9. This is likely to be temporary. We are not going to see another decline in UK CPI. We are going to see potentially another big jump. Really the big question is by how much are we going to see a jump? Um, we're at 3.2 percent now. 
headline CPI is expected to rise from 3.2% to 3.9 um, and core prices to 3.7. Now, it's not inconceivable we could see four. We'll certainly see four by the end of the year. And the Bank of England is projecting we could well see 5%, 5% CPI. The last time we were there was back in 2011. And what did the Bank of England do when that happened? Absolutely nothing albeit interest rates, base rates were slightly higher there. But a big rise in this week's October numbers will merely serve to shift the focus back on the Bank of England and, and essentially say to them, what are you thinking when it comes to interest rates? What were you thinking? What are you thinking? You know, if this doesn't cause you to push rates, start to lift rates back to 0.25 to 0.5, what will? And I think the unemployment numbers and the CPI numbers are going to be core to expectations as to what the Bank of England might do next month. So we'll need to, and, and the key thing about that is, is that we'll not only get this month's or the October report, we'll also have the November report because the Bank of England doesn't report until mid-December. So they'll have two unemployment reports to work through and work off, and they'll also have two inflation reports to work off. Then on Friday, we've got UK retail sales. I talked about that a little bit earlier. The fuel crisis did provide an uplift to fuel sales, but it but it was offset by a big fall in discretionary spend. Um, home, home goods in September retail sales saw a big decline. And that's something that I certainly didn't factor in. You know, I thought, you know, even if you're queuing up for petrol, you could always order stuff online, but apparently not. So um, we saw a bit of a decline in UK retail sales of 0.2% in September. So when are we going to see a rise in UK retail sales? Well, I suppose October is as good a month as any, so is November. We certainly haven't seen much of a rebounding consumer spending since then, largely, I think, because of the fact that most people have been more interested in experiences, going on holidays, going to cinemas, eating out, none of which are included in UK retail sales numbers. So um, it's not surprising, perhaps, that um, with people being outdoors, they haven't been shopping online for Blu-rays, videos, DVDs and clothes and what have you. They've been out and about enjoying outdoor events. So certainly be an interesting dynamic when it comes to the UK retail sales. Got US retail sales as well. Not really going to go into too much detail about them. What I will say is though, in addition to the key macro numbers this week, we also have got some fairly important earnings announcements. Um, to, to one from Royal Mail, one from Vodafone, one from Walmart, one from NVIDIA. Going back to the retail sales numbers and some of the recent earnings numbers that we've seen out of retailers like Marks and Spencers, next, you know, they some really decent numbers, Associated British Foods, Primark. They've, all of those brands have posted really decent um, quarterly sales numbers. These, for some reason, are not being reflected in the UK retail sales numbers. And you've got to ask yourself, why not? It seems utterly strange to me that you've got UK retailers posting some fairly decent numbers, and yet the official ONS numbers aren't reflecting these improvements in the finances of these big UK retailers. What is going on? So I'm starting to get a little bit sceptical about how useful UK retail sales numbers are. Nonetheless, looking at the way companies are performing, it does suggest that we're probably not doing as badly as perhaps the official numbers suggest. Anyway, I'm digressing slightly. In terms of earnings numbers this week, we've got Royal Mail. Um, they've been in a slow decline pretty much um, since the economy started to reopen all the way back in May last year. And I suppose that's not too surprising. I think once people can go out more, they start to order less online and certainly i think that is reflected in royal mail share price since since may but they're still in pretty good shape year to date so um certainly don't really want to start calling time on the rebound quite yet 
Um, but nonetheless, I think if you look at the numbers, um, group adjusted operating profit for the first half is still expected to come in between 395 million to 400 million pounds. And the second half is expected to deliver a better performance on profits and margins for the simple reason is that Royal Mail tends to do more business as we head towards the Christmas period, um, as more and more people order stuff online. Having said that, their costs also go up as they hire and recruit extra staff to cope with the Christmas rush. Um, nonetheless, um, as long as we hold above 400p, the shares do look in fairly decent shape, even if some of um, some of what's happened over the course of the last six months might suggest we've seen a little bit of a slowdown in the wider business. Vodafone. Vodafone, we've got first half numbers for Vodafone. Look at this nice little channel here. That's worked quite well so far. We're starting to break up through the upper part of that channel. And in terms of how the company performed in Q1, revenues um, revenues came in ahead of expectations. Shares have struggled though, you know, and it's hard, it's, it's, it's difficult to really understand why. Obviously, the lack of cross-border travel has meant roaming revenues are down, but they will have started to pick up in the course of the past um, few weeks. The company says it's on track to meet its full year EBITDA target between 15 billion and 15.4 billion euros, with, with half of that expected in the first half. Total revenues for the first half of this year expect to come in around about 22.1 billion euros. As I say, keep an eye on this upper line here looking at some point for the shares to bottom out and start to edge higher again obviously they have higher costs in terms of their businesses in spain and italy but also in terms of the rollout of 5g um, but they have come a long way they've fallen a long way um, so far this year so they're probably well overdue a little bit of a rebound going forward it's also a big week for us retail um, we've got Walmart, we've got Target, we've got Home Depot or Home Depot. I always call it Depot when in when in Rome, when I'm in when I'm in the USA. Where's Home Depot? Not where's Home Depot, because people look at me as if I'm odd. Um, so we've got Q3 numbers from three of the US's biggest retailers. Walmart obviously um, is up there with Amazon when it comes to competition. What's striking about this though is the shares have gone nowhere. Um, pretty much over the course of the past year or so. And that's for any number of reasons. Obviously, more and more and more people are out and about, which obviously means that given its e-commerce operation, it's one of the few US retailers that was able to take the fight to Amazon um, and, has an, and, has, and has actually been able to compete on equal terms. Um, but um, in terms of how it's done this year, um, I think the bigger question is obviously it's having to cope with tougher comparatives from a year ago. So it's always very difficult to try and outdo um, a year when you've probably done record revenues and record profits. And in terms of its Q2 revenues, they were $141 billion, which is, um, which is not too bad uh, when you consider it, which was an increase on the Q1 of $138.1 billion. Companies also hiring um, more people, over half a million people it's a, in new hires over the course of the past 12 months. Um, so Q3 could be the calm before the storm as we look to the challenges of Q4. Obviously, you've got Thanksgiving and Christmas coming up. I had President Biden in the White House talking to the CEOs of Walmart and uh, UPS and all through the US supply chain um, and asking them or, or asking them what their plans were and how their logistics and the supply chains were holding up in the lead up to Christmas, which suggests the Biden administration is concerned about the rising costs that companies are having to face as well as consumers are having to face. So the big question for me is how many more staff will Walmart have to recruit to meet demand? More to the point, how resilient are their supply chains to pre-Thanksgiving and Christmas demand? Um, still expected to see decent profits of around about $1.39 a share, but it does look a little bit toppy all the way 
through here. So perhaps we're going to see further chop, further um, uh, further chop in the same way that we've been seeing for most of this year. Target, this is the day after. Again, similar concerns, supply chains, how many more, how much of this, how much of their costs going to go up has been doing slightly better than its sector peer um, Walmart. If we look at, say, for example, Target's um, share price, we can see that from this one here. There we go. Let's open that up, get rid of that, get rid of that, and put that up there. So year to date, Target shares have done slightly better, but again, they're near record highs. So how much of that juice is already priced in to Target's share price? Um, so I think that's pretty much it. Oh, yes, NVIDIA, chip makers. Thought would make it a little bit topical. Um, I mean, this, I mean this, this chart just looks off the scale. Um, we've seen some big gains in chip makers this year. NVIDIA has been one of those. Um, one of the reasons for that is because of the fact that um, they've just re recently launched a new suite of chip products called the Omniverse, specifically to target the metaverse. Um, now, the shares are currently up over 100% year to date. It's so far away from its 200 day moving average, it's not funny, which suggests to me that perhaps, just perhaps, whisper it quietly, an awful lot of the good news may already priced in. Ultimately, that doesn't mean the share price can't continue to go higher, but ultimately, at some point, the price will have to revert back to its mean and its 200 day moving average. Now, revenues, I think, in terms of NVIDIA, they're going to be the key component here. Um, 6.5 billion dollars of revenues in Q2, 5.6 billion dollars in Q1. So the big question is, are they going to be able to beat the 6.51 billion dollar revenue rise that we saw in Q2? You know, gaming drove pretty much almost half of that at $3 billion. Data center revenue, which uh, NVIDIA is moving into $2.37 billion. And the company says it expects to see Q3 revenue. This is the company's estimate, $6.8 billion, despite concerns over chip supply. But obviously, chip prices are going up. So it wouldn't surprise me to see them beat on revenues. The big question is, um, will it be enough to sustain the share price at current levels? So that's, that's a big one. And that's due on the 17th of November. So um, in terms of this week, that's pretty much it for this week's weekly video. Once again, I'd like to thank you very much for listening. Um, hope you all have a great uh, weekend and speak to you all same time, same place next week. Thank you very much for listening. This is Michael Houston talking to you from CMC Markets.